Okay, um, this is a project called Is Love a Synonym for Abolition? What if I told you that I love you? Would that make a difference? I'm determined to believe in a love so principled that it can open possibilities we've never known. Bell Hooks teaches me that love is not easy. She writes that true love requires an ongoing commitment to constructive struggle and change. Even in the most loving relationships, we encounter edges and find friction with one another. I have found that these tensions actually construct our identity, that the differences between us give us a sense of who we are. And along these edges is the location of possibility and change. It's really quite frightening, but our political futures depend on our collective capacity to surrender to the self-actualizing process of change. And we can lean on love to find the courage to do so. Is love a political strategy? Is abolition an agenda of love? These are questions I'm interested in exploring in this project. I'm trying to understand the way that difference encourages change. And I'm trying to suggest that abolition is a practice of love, which asks more from each of us and gives us all something greater in return. Difference of identity or belief is often associated with disruption or standstill some sort of stagnation. But Judith Butler writes that difference actually composes the very conditions of possibility for movement, maturity, and change. Let's consider our contemporary political context, where identity and difference are blamed for the apparent fracturing of the left, and where identity politics are misinterpreted as inherently factionalizing and sectarian. Butler noticed that identity and universality are assumed to be fundamentally incompatible, that one cannot exist alongside the other. But if you actually read the work of members of the Kambahi River Collective, Kimberly Crenshaw or Patrice Cullors, you'll find that identity politics seeks to develop an awareness of the unique and personal life situations that emerge from our identities in a way that actually expands our investment in political struggle. Members of the Kambahi River Collective write that separatism and fragmentation are not viable political analyses or strategies because they leave out far too much and far too many people. So we see that a candid assessment of our identity doesn't trap us within its limits or inhibit our capacity for critical analysis. It actually widens our scope and our political potential. So why is difference so challenging for us to work with? I found Judith Butler's theorizations on difference and unity to be really helpful. She observes a dynamic where the moderate left calls for unity, even unanimity, while casting a sort of suspicious glance towards both ends of the political spectrum. The moderate might say that both ends are devolving into identitarian factions and that we just need to find common ground. But Butler says that we can't impose unity from the outside. That would be undemocratic and unproductive. She writes that any form of unity that is abstracted from its location in power will necessarily lack the actual tools required to bring about meaningful and persistent change. She maintains that the search for unity cannot be resolved through the transcendence or obliteration of difference, because that only reinstitutes subordination as the condition of its own possibility, where unity is dominant and difference is subordinate. From here, Butler wants us to recognize difference as a mobilizing and active force that actually provides the basis for all change processes. Unlike factionalization, which names difference as that which emerges between one identity and another, or that which differentiates one from another, Butler considers the self-difference of movement itself as a constitutive rupture that makes movements possible and that installs a certain mobilizing conflict as the basis of politicization. Difference is not the distance between one thing and another, but rather the friction that two things find when coming up against one another. And just like in chemistry and in physics, it is in this place of friction where we experience change. Mutual change and growth is different than synthesis. Like love, it's not so easy. Instead, it kind of indicates that one identity may be static 
until it encounters another. Only then is identity given the opportunity to clarify itself and to make its edges known. And it's along these edges where we find potential and priority and where we actually put those identities into practice. This line of thought disproves solipsism and attests to the vital importance of community. So Butler assures us that unity will not be the synthesis of a set of conflicts, but will be a mode of sustaining conflict in politically productive ways. Difference compels democratic participation, otherwise it can't be worked through. It requires that we practice coming into conflict without disintegrating ourselves or dividing from one another. In other words, encounters with difference offer the opportunity to maintain personal and even political boundaries without foregoing the possibility of agreement, understanding, and convergence. In this way, difference welcomes us to develop a sense of alliance with conflictual encounter so that our political movements may learn to articulate their goals under the pressure of each other without therefore exactly becoming each other. Difference requires that we act with personal integrity and self-esteem, asserting ourselves in accordance with those values, beliefs, and experiences that shape our identity. Audre Lorde writes, we do not have to become each other in order to work together. Coming into and emerging through conflict is a process essential to self-understanding, exploration, and self-discovery. In the same way that difference is the condition of a possibility of identity, self-assertion is essential to self-understanding. However, Bell Hooks notes that people are often socialized to understand conflict as the setting for put-downs and humiliation, the place where we are shamed. We learn that being in conflict is equivalent to being bad. Instead of being celebrated for the courage and honesty we express during conflict, we learn to practice either avoidance or aggression, and we develop an incompetent approach to self-assertion. We do not know how to negotiate ourselves against the tension of other human beings. So what does this indicate about our present political reality? Angela Davis writes about how the site of the prison replaces any real attempt to address the most pressing social problems of our time. The prison is a place to put bad people not a place to consider, work with, and move beyond the actual behaviors or conditions of harm that made bad things possible in the first place. In this way, the prison's very existence forecloses the kinds of discussions that we need in order to imagine the possibility of eradicating those behaviors and conditions. Certainly, those discussions would require conflict, conversation, reconciliation, and a commitment to seeing the strategy through. This is precisely what Bell Hooks describes when she writes that true love is an ongoing commitment to constructive struggle and change. She writes that when it comes to love, we are falsely conditioned to invest in the fantasy of effortless union. But just like sustaining any political movement, sustaining love takes work. Let's take it a step further. True love requires a commitment to being changed to being acted upon by the beloved in a way that enables us to be more fully self-actualized. So in this way, true love is a risk because it necessarily reveals those aspects of ourselves that we may wish to deny or hide. I would suggest that it is through and within true love that we find the courage to risk. Like abolition, love is a risk. Yes, love is terrifying. It requires so much of us, and it gives us so much back. In many ways, this is not so different from the abolitionist political imagination, which asks us to give more of ourselves, to receive more in return. Marquise Bay conceptualizes abolition as a radically imaginative and generative, creative and world-building political vision that emphasizes consent rather than coercion, self and communal governance, the advancement of direct action, the advocacy for the dismantling of all hierarchies, and expressed global solidarity with all who are oppressed and subject to hierarchical tyranny. In an abolitionist world, prisons, courts, and police would be replaced with community-run programs and centers interested solely with human regeneration and social training. 
Without the prison, we would encounter each other constantly in all of our mistakes and shames with a sincere and unwavering commitment to help each other to achieve each of our goals of self-unfoldment. In other words, we would encounter one another with love. Sadia Hartman wonders, is love a synonym for abolition? Certainly, our politics must be lived out in our bodies and relationships. Otherwise, they escape us. They are intangible and ultimately ineffective. Our intentions must inform our actions. Marquise Bay writes that we cannot separate the articulation of ideas that would govern how we envision the future from actually enacting that future. In every moment, we can make a choice to begin. While an abolitionist world is not yet accessible, we make do in the meantime, trusting that the things done in the interim may not have the look of complete abolition, but are nonetheless in service of that end. I like this thought because it gives us some grace and allows us to be patient and dedicated. See, an abolitionist future refuses endings altogether, believing that difference and tension form the basis of a more expansive and dynamic political impulse. We practice care, aid, participation, and non-authority, and we invest in the most localized structures of life and livability, which are our own bodies and relationships. Maybe then love is the way that we practice our political visions iteratively, celebrating each turning form and the possibility that each new output potentiates. We meet those that we love in conflict and care. We create something meaningful from the frictions between us. Inevitably, we will find more frictions and encounter further contestation, but that's okay, as long as we do not expect or rely on conclusions. Marquise Bay affirms that refusing an end allows for a perpetual openness that enables always the possibility of another beginning. This position, which is itself only an insistent movement towards infinitude, is precarious. It requires that we submit to the turbulence of powerlessness. It is definitely the case that knowing and keeping true love demands that we surrender our compulsion towards control. We have no idea what's going to happen. We sacrifice our old selves in order to be changed by love, and we surrender to the power of the new. And what we find in return is the power of self-actualization and co-creation, the bold and courageous experience of being known, being loved, and being changed utterly. <laughs>